Brought to you by Aiming for Jesus, Franklin County, Stories of Our Lives. The stories that make up the lives of our Franklin County, Mississippi family of people, from the current to the ancient, to the funny, to the uplifting. And now, here's Hollis McGeehee. I don't know for sure whether you know these two fellows here in this picture, but I'll tell you a couple of things. If you don't know them, then I suspect your claim of being Franklin County born and raised may be a falsehood. And if you do know them, then you know what I'm about to tell you is the show enough truth and nothing but the truth. This is on the left, Clarence Dillon, and on the right, his older brother, Lee Dillon. Now, Lee lived down in Lexi in the southern part of Walthall County, where, in fact, a lot of the Dillons came from before they came over in our country. I want to talk for a few minutes about Mr. Lee Dillon. I've got some stories about Clarence Dillon I can't wait to tell, but today's story is going to be more about the gentleman on the right who played for the Memphis Chicks semi-pro baseball back in the day. Uh, he told me one time that he said, he said, organ music makes me squall. <laughs> he, he said that now he was raised hard shell Baptist, but he'd tell me about going over to Siloam Baptist church, which was just kind of across the holler from his house, really where he was raised, Mr. Bill Dillon and Miss Polly Dillon his parents and let's see there was i'm gonna mess this up but there was lee and glady and um and clarence and prentice and oh me uh, uh ernest and uh lillian and and i'm leaving out two or three or four uh and i can't can't think of them right this second but there was a passel of them and, and they were mighty good folks and they lived up that road behind the Pine Knot baseball field. Now, look, Pine Knot is serious baseball. And that's another story we'll come back to a little more completely on another day. But Mr. Lee was telling me about going over to Siloam Baptist Church to a funeral. And he said, I'd go in there and I hadn't as much as sat down. And they'd go to play in that sweet by and by, and I'd go to squalling. And he said, my mom was want to beat me to get me to hush up. But he said that organ music just made me squall. Mr. Lee Dillon could just talk about life. And he was funnier than any comedian that ever walked. If, if they had a, uh, one of these realistic shows today, one of these real life shows today, and you could put a couple of these boys on there, they'd blow the, the ceiling off the ratings. They, pe people would be watching reruns into the two cent till Jesus comes back. Mr. Lee was, was one of those people. He ran a little uh, metal shop down at uh, Lexi where he made these like, well, like that building you see, that's Clarence's house over at Beulah. And that's another wonderful story, but again, for another day. But Mr. Lee would be telling me about that organ music, and he'd tell me about, he got to tell me one day about one of his relatives. He said, I'm not going to call the name, but he said, well, he said, the county's just going to have to bury him. And I can't remember that gentleman's name that drove. It was a temple, I believe. It drove the, uh, I know it. I just can't say it. Uh, he drove the the dump truck, and he said that they'll have to tote him off. He said he won't have a penny left. They'll have to They'll have to bury him in the pauper's grave in the county. The county will have to haul him off. But it got him to talking about dying. And he told me, he said, you know, 
He said, if you died in the, in the good springtime after it warmed up, he said, you could have a fine funeral. He said, you'd have, and he'd list all the flowers you could have as a springtime funeral. He said, it'd make a fine funeral. And then he said, you know, but on up in the summer, and, and I think the flowers he mentioned then was a flower called Kate Jessam, and, or maybe Jessup. And he said in the dirt, he would describe the dirt. He said it was so fine because it had, it had uh, matured and kind of gotten uh, soft and, and it was fine. And so when you were pouring that dirt on in the, in the late summer, he said it wouldn't hardly make any noise. See, they'd put that box down in the bottom of the hole, and then they'd come on top of that with a couple of boards. And he said that that fine dirt just shoveling down on it didn't make much noise. He said, but the problem there was you didn't get to have as good a squalling as you had. He said, you put on a fine funeral to show sure enough see some people squall if you got, if you was to die in the winter time, he said, now you might not have much flowers. He said, but goodness gracious, the squalling and crying and gnashing of teeth that would take place. He said, cause them big old dirt clods, see, it wouldn't be like it was in the hot summer. Them big dirt clods would fall in there on top of that, um, those boards on top of the casket. And he bang, bang, he described just what they sounded like. He said, man, that was some fine funeral. You could hear people squalling for a mile away. <laughs> I could go on and on telling, telling Lee Dillon stories. I'll close with this one. Even when I think of his name, my head starts to shake a little bit because in the latter part of Lee's life, he had the shakes. And one day his sister, Glidey Hancock, Glidey Dillon Hancock, Miss Glidey was not shy about saying what was on her mind or asking questions. And Miss Glidey said, Lee, I see you got that shaking in your head. What you going to do about it? He said, well, Glidey, I reckon I'll just shake her till I shake her out. <laughs> Mr. Lee Dillon, what a man. The gold hole that never was. Ooh, I may get in trouble for saying that. There's as much controversy about the gold hole in Franklin County as about any other thing you want to talk about over there, and you can get folks stirred up pretty quick saying that there is or there isn't. So the story goes back, depending on which story you believe, for hundred, hundred, or maybe hundreds of years back to when uh, the Natchez Trace and the Mississippi River were uh, fertile ground for thieves to steal and be highwaymen and take things. And supposedly one of those great robbers uh, had a place there, what was later the property owned by the Dove family west of Highway 33, uh, right on the western side of Franklin County where it joins Adams County. And as you can see from the, the pictures, how can you say there's not a gold hole? There's a sign, a highway sign that says you you got uh, 9-11 addresses that are based on the gold hole. So how could I possibly argue that there is no gold hole? Well, I don't know if there is or there isn't, but what I do know is that a lot of effort's been put in, a lot of speculation, a lot of money spent trying to dig for something that from what anybody knows for sure has never been obtained. But like I heard uh, Doc Passenger say, uh, we don't know whether he found it or not. He wouldn't say, but he went out to Texas and retired right after that. So maybe there was gold in the hole, and maybe the gold were those that uh, made the money digging for it. I don't know. But for my two cents worth, I'm going to say that, that it's kind of like the the other stories that you're going to hear about in a few minutes, things that that appeared to be but were not, whether we're talking about electric paddles or we're talking about bears that didn't exist, 
dry counties. I think the gold hole fits into that category, no matter how you shake it out. Those things that may have appeared to be, but in fact were not. My friends, I had not intended to discuss this controversial subject at this particular time. However, I want you to know that I do not shun controversy. On the contrary, I will take a stand on any issue at any time, regardless of how fraught with controversy it might be. You have asked me how I feel about whiskey. All right? Here is how I feel about whiskey. If, when you say whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys the home, creates misery and poverty, yea, literally takes the bread from the mouths of little children. If you mean the evil drink that topples the Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteous, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, then certainly I am against it. But if when you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together, that puts a song in their hearts and laughter on their lips and the warm glow of contentment in their eyes. If you mean Christmas cheer, if you mean the stimulating drink that puts the spring in the old gentleman's step on a frosty, crisp morning, if you mean the drink which enables a man to magnify his joy and his happiness and to forget, if only for a little while, life's great tragedies and heartaches and sorrows, if you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasuries untold millions of dollars which are used to provide tender care for our little crippled children, our blind, our deaf, our dumb, our pitiful aged and infirm, to build highways and hospitals and schools, then certainly I am for it. This is my stand. I will not retreat from it. I will not compromise. A speech by N.S. Sweat, Soggy Sweat, made in 1954 before the Mississippi legislature. Well, I don't mind telling you that I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is because I drank so much of it and made so many messes. I can't blame the, the alcohol because I'm responsible, but I hate it. It's, it's caused a lot of destruction. But nevertheless, I want to I want to talk for a few minutes about Franklin Dry County. Franklin County was the only dry county it seemed like around for a while. There there was some form of alcohol in the other counties. I think as long as I can remember. And of course, people that uh, most of them are gone now. But there was a time when when the whole state. Uh, had access to alcohol of one kind or another, and that's not true. I mean, wasn't true at that time. But so we're talking about things that were not. <laughs> Franklin County were not a dry county. It might have been dry in name, but that was the only thing that was dry. Uh, in that famous state statement about uh, – James New, James Wentworth, I'm sorry, said uh, you can hear anything in Franklin County, but meat frying and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you could you could add that that you can hear the the rattle of bottles for sure. So, how did it come about that Franklin County was a dry county that wasn't dry? Well, it was so undry that there were places that were not in hiding whatsoever where a person could go and, and buy alcohol, and some of them were, were local business establishments, and some of them were just houses, and some of them were places on the side of the road by, by a still or by a place where somebody had stashed some some stuff and you could just pull up there and they'd run back in the bushes and pull you out a half pint of old crow, old charter, 
uh, old r- rotten gut, whatever, whatever it might have been. So Franklin County being dry, that was one of those things that never existed. It was one of those things that we called it that it was, but in fact, it's like the bear that never was. It was the dry county that never was. I'm I'm laughing because there there's certainly some funny things happen, and we've all if if you've been involved in that at all, you know you've done some funny things. But truthfully, it does steal our thoughts and and send us down a trail that's contrary to the one God called us to have. Now God never says in His Word, "Thou shalt not drink." but he doesn't want anything controlling us, but the Holy spirit, we shall not, not be a drunkard. Of course, is what it says. So one of the things that was not, even though it said it was, was Franklin as a dry County in the summer of 1963. I want to tell you about something happened that summer involving a bear in Franklin County. The bear that never was. Uh, these fellows, Neil Causey and Garnell Jackson and Bobby Jackson and Ed Lee and C.V. Glennis went out to Clear Springs Lake to spend the night to camp out. And they brought them some vittles. They had some hot dogs and buns and cookies and cold drinks. Well, I, I don't know if they were cold. And they had picked them out a spot to camp and they put their blankets down and fixed a little place for a fire and put wood in it, had everything set up. It wasn't quite dark. Nobody else was there. So they went for a little swim, you know, yeah, skinny dipping in Clear Springs Lake. They swam for about an hour, and it was good dark when they got out of the lake and they got dressed, and they they went up there to the campsite to light the fire. And when they got that fire lit, they looked around and their food was gone. The hot dogs were gone. The cookies had been chewed up, strewn all around. They could see some pieces of buns leading away down one of the trails of the lake. So they decided, heck, we're going to try to find our food. We ain't got anything else to eat. They started walking. They didn't have a flashlight. They couldn't hardly see anything. It was a dark night. But just a little piece from the camp, uh, Neil Causey said, look, a bear. You know, back then, the government had just started placing those black bears back in the National Forest. They could see him. He was about maybe taller than three feet, but he was on his all fours. They just knew he had their food. One of them had a queen steel hunting knife. And and that was CV. And Neil said, let's get him. I'm going to run up and kick him. We were all barefooted. They jumped up and jumped at him and stabbed him. And CV told Neil, we could be arrested for killing a bear. We'll just kick his butt. Them bear claws and teeth could rip us up, C.V. said. He's a little concerned about that. We, They talked about how they were going to get the bear. The bear never moved the entire time they were talking about him. And finally, Neil and C.V. decided they were going to both go kick that bear and tackle the bear and just kick his butt. The other guys were kind of listening and laughing and holding back and they got themselves all talked up into, got their courage going, and they counted down to three, and they charged that bear. And one of them Jackson boys had gone back to fire and came back with a burning stick. That bear wasn't a bear. It was a sign made by the rangers giving directions to a trail. It was oval, and it was built on two wood four-by-fours in the ground. Ooh, we would have broke our toes if we'd kicked that bear. Back around the campsite with the light going, two old hound dogs were seen skulking around. Then they figured it out. Those dogs had gotten their food. 
they didn't tell anybody else because they didn't want them laughing at them, but they laughed a lot about this for years and years. They enjoyed that story about the bear that never was. I don't know about where you were, but when we were in elementary school, the teachers and particularly the, the uh, principal, they had a secret weapon, and it was called the electric paddle. Man, we were scared to death of that thing. We never did actually get to see it, but we heard about it. We didn't want to see it. We didn't want to know any more about it than what we had heard. Because when you got in trouble, sure enough trouble, and you got sent to the office, they plugged that sucker in, and it didn't quit until you quit. Man, that electric paddle was something. I've talked to a lot of people from a lot of other schools. I think we were the only one that had it. I guess, you know, Franklin County being the center of the universe and all, uh, maybe maybe it was a prototype. I don't know. But we had an electric paddle. Mr. Tennyson was the principal and, and Coach Holloway, Joe Holloway. He was allowed to use it too. So those two, we, we saw them coming and we paid attention because they were the keepers of the electric paddle. Let's give thanks to God for all our blessings. Lord, thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to be born and raised in Franklin County, Mississippi. We thank you, Lord, that you have been with us and you continue to be with us. Lord, help us to be with you. Help us to trust in you to rest in you, to find in you our all in all. Thank you, Lord, for these and many other people from our county who touched our lives in special ways. Those that are still with us, bless them. And those that have gone on, bless their families. We thank you, God, for them. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes this episode of Franklin County Stories of Our Lives. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, let's keep aiming for Jesus.